Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Welcome back to Wisdom. I'm sorry, I got the giggles. <laughs> she got the giggles and we have decided, so we just finished book club and we thought it was so much fun and it was such a good conversation that it's going to be today's episode of Wisdom Wednesday. Do you Yay. want to tell the listeners a little bit more about what happened during our book club? Oh, well, we talked about some really epic novels that we mm-hmm. may read, that we will yes. read at some point we will. in time. And you, dear listeners, get to weigh in and vote for them. Um, also, one of my favorite topics, I think, Rosie, probably the same for you, is the idea of relationship, true love, soulmate. Oh, yeah, we um, went in there. Yeah, it was We went great in. Novel. Uh, so, so much so that we wanted to share it with all of you. For those of you that maybe didn't know that we're doing a book club, that way you can get a little feel of what we're doing and yeah, weigh in, let us know what your thoughts are. Also, uh, please remember that you support us by supporting our sponsors. So check them out in the info button or wherever you're listening to this podcast or watching this. If you're watching it on YouTube, just check the description below. Make sure that you help us by helping them and help yourself. Hello, friends. I want to tell you about Kachava, my all-in-one daily super blend. If you're worried you aren't getting all the nutrients you need or struggling to stay on top of your health, then listen up because Kachava has you covered. Kachava puts everything in your body it needs in one glass so you can have it all. All the superfoods, all the vitamins, all the omegas, all the adaptogens, all the greens, all the proteins, all the benefits for your gut, your skin, your hair, your brain, your muscles, your heart, your whole health. No more compromise, no more guilt, no other nutrition shake does it all like this. They travel to the ends of the earth to source them all and crush it up. Kachava is a powder you take two scoops, just add water, blend it up, and it tastes incredible. They have five delicious flavors. Chocolate and chai are my personal favorite. I drink kachava for breakfast and it keeps me full for hours. There's no way I could get all of these nutrients in my normal diet. And trying to manage all of the supplements and the ingredients you should be taking, I mean, it's a little overwhelming and very expensive. But now Kachava makes clean, organic, superfood nutrition accessible to everyone. You've got to try Kachava for yourself. Kachava is offering 10% off for a limited time. Go to kachava.com forward slash loved, spelled K-A-C-H-A-V-A and get 10% off of your first order. That's K-A-C-H-A-V-A dot com forward slash loved to get 10% off for a limited time. Kachava dot com forward slash loved. Welcome to our Radically Loved Sessions. This is our book club of book club of the month, I'm calling it. This is so much fun. So I have apologies for shifting the date. I came back last week and was so incredibly jet lagged that even if I had kept our time, I probably would have slept through it. I was on such an opposite uh, schedule. And, and so I, and I'm grateful for those of you. And I know a lot of you said that you can make it to this week, which is totally fine. So hopefully you're watching this and you can uh, send us your questions. Uh, So Tessa's here with me today. Hello. Hello, everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. It almost feels a little bit like we're recording a Wisdom Wednesday, but... Yeah, I almost actually... (laughs) Maybe we should just use this for for a Wisdom (laughs) Wisdom Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. (laughs) 
I almost said, welcome back to Wisdom, Wisdom Wednesday. 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 So I, we're in the final, final chapters of the book. And there's a couple of topics that I wanted to bring up pertaining to um, chapter nine. And I figured we'd wait for the final chapter for our final meeting next month, which will be on the date that's it's scheduled for. I believe it's the first week of August, Friday at 12 o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time. And uh, after that, I'm going to send a survey out to everybody so that we can choose what our next book is going to be. And uh, Tessa is going to provide us some options. So it's not one of those like everybody's just going to start naming a random book. We're going to give you five different options to choose from. And if you have ideas, you can always email them to me if there's something that you're reading or something that you think would be a really fun topic for us to discuss. Just send it send it over and, and we'll consider putting it on the list. Uh, any other announcements? I think that's it for now. Um, yeah. Okay. Tessa, you have anything? No? I'm just super excited about getting to choose from five beloved books. I so. know. This is, <gasps> this is really fun. Yes. I mean, what, and the other, one of the other things that I was chatting with a couple of people the last time was like what genre, like we don't mm, have yeah. to stick to the self help genre. We can do a novel. We could do what we could do anything. We could do a book about business, but I mean, if people are into that, I, I just think it's really fun if we start taking, I mean, I would love to do this. Oh, I just shifted my, oh, my camera didn't move, but it moved for me. You're still I, there. <laughs> I would love to do this. Oh, the devil's dictionary. Yes. Sorry. Okay. You talk because I just took your screen. Away. No, do it. Do it. That's fine. That's fine. If, you, if you've not picked this up, this is a cyberpunk post, I don't want to say apocalyptic, but it's, it's a very, uh, like deep type of novel that there's twists and turns. There's so many compelling characters in here. It deals with a lot of topics that we're dealing with in our current climate. It's it's really cool. I don't know. I, I'm into stuff like this. So that would be my pick, but nobody else might want everybody might be like, oh, there's some what is this doing right here? <laughs> You're so cute. It's that little hair. I love your little hairs. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so, oh, God, yeah, what is happening? Hold on, let me fix this little head, man. Why don't you talk for a second? So the one thing that I would add to what Rosie said about the Devil's Dictionary and, and genre, speaking of genre, because when I pick up a book like that, I immediately think sci-fi, which I think sci-fi is one of those genres that you either love, love or, or hate. Right. Or yes. maybe you not hate, but it's not something that you're drawn to. And I think that um, the way that Stephen Kotler writes is so compelling. And it's it's one of those novels that you open the book, you start reading and you're immediately hooked. Even if sci fi is not your genre, it is so like Rosie said, so relevant. There's so many um, really interesting topics, characters, twists and turns. Oh, it kind of reads like a thrill thriller. Um, but there's some romance and there's something for everyone. In yes. Did you ever read? Yes. Uh, everything that you said. Yes. I love, but did you ever read, um, what is this called over the overstory? Oh, okay. So that book keeps trying to jump off the shelf at me and I haven't picked it up yet. And every time I go to Powell's, I pick it up and I read the back and I'm like, why haven't I bought this book yet? <laughs> So that's going to be one of the five on our list because apparently the universe is telling us that there's something, there's some message in there. Yeah. Yes. Rosie's holding it, it yeah, up. Yeah. I have it right here. This, if you haven't read it, I've not read it. I, it's, oh, I had it the same issue book. that you were having. People kept telling me about it and I finally picked it up. It's a, a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, novel. So I'll read you the back just for 
you guys, since we're here and this may be one of the options, uh, this is a uh, national, does it say? Okay, National Book Award winner Richard Powers' 12th novel is a sweeping, impassioned work of activism and resistance that is also a stunning evocation of an of of and p p a n i don't know how you say that pay pay in to the natural world from the roots to the crown and back to the seeds the overstory unfolds in concentric rings of interlocking fables that range from antebellum new york to the late 20th century timber wars of the pacific northwest and beyond oh. there's uh huh. There is a world alongside ours, vast, slow, interconnected, resourceful, magnificently inventive, and almost invisible to us. This is a story of a handful of people who learn how to see the world and who are drawn up into its unfolding catastrophe. Mm, I think this is this might be the one. I mean, not to put a pin in it. Not. To, not I know. Not, well, not no, but it's it. but it's interesting <laughs> because as you were as you were talking, you know, and it's funny, you know, you know the actual truth of why this is even here. Hmm. Because when we had our conversation about you going backpacking the first time, not not the episode we recorded, but the first time we talked about it, it reminded me of the description of this. And I'm like, oh, I, I wonder where that book is. I know I bought it's dusty. I'm like, I wonder yeah. where it is. And I was going through my stuff and I found it, it was in the house. And so I, I brought it in here in my Zen den because this is a place where I like to escape to read. And and you just, as you were talking right now, it just came back in. So there might be something, I don't know. What do you What do you all think? Uh, well, Raquel oh, seems on board. Yeah, Raquel says she. This is a book. Okay, she's been waiting to maybe. I mean, we could. Sorry, those of you that are watching this, if you weren't here live with us, maybe this is going to be the book. It's got my vote. It's got your vote. Let's see. We'll we'll send a survey out anyway, and we'll see what people pick. But we may make an executive decision. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, just sounds like awesome, it right? That. It does. It does. You know what I think is interesting about that as you're reading it, I'm realizing for the first time what might be my resistance to it. And I had this, did you ever read American Dirt? Yes. No, uh, no, I'm sorry. Tori read it. I listened to like the first couple chapters and I think we talked about this. I didn't finish yeah, it. Did I you finish did. it? I did. So here's what happened in this very similar sensation in my body right now. Okay. I picked it up. Go. I was like, I know I need to read this book. It's really important. I picked it up. I opened it. I read the first maybe five pages and then I was like, oh my God, I can't handle this right now. It was oh. so intense because it is a very intense book. And for me, it feels like, okay, this is real. This is a novel, but this is real. This stuff happens every day, all the time, 24 seven. And it felt like I couldn't handle it emotionally. So I was like, okay, I have to be a little bit stronger emotionally to be able to, to go through this journey. Um, because you know how I am. I'm like, I just dive in and then I assume all of the emotions of the characters yes, and, and you I'm really dive in. Journey. You're very empathetic. I think that's the resistance to this book, the overstory, because I feel such a communion with the trees as everyone, yes. when you watch wisdom Wednesday next week, we'll see, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like the trees are getting cut down, clear cut. I feel like I'm dying when I see that. Oh, um, and that sounds really dramatic, I know, but it's like, what else? What else are you supposed to feel when you feel yeah. that kind of union with with Mother Nature? Yeah, I mean, honestly, not to get dark here, we'll we'll bring it back up once we start to read Chapter Nine. Okay, right? let's do that. Ish. Yes, um, but not to get too dark on that same tip. I think I felt this. I feel the same way you do about the trees and and the forest in the wilderness like this, I feel that way about the ocean. Mm, yeah. And so whenever I see all the plastic and I see just the way that people just, I mean, back, you know, I just got back from Guam and just learning a little bit of history back in, after the second world war, after they, the United States acquired the, the territory of Guam. So it's a U.S. territory. They just dumped all of their equipment in the ocean, like all the tanks, all the stuff that they weren't using, like they just dumped it in the ocean, like 
let's just throw it in there. And it is just so incredibly heartbreaking to see and, and live the devastation of our ancestors, right? The, the way that people just treat the earth, you know, I, I think coming from, you know, a Hispanic, uh, indigenous background, you know, my, having my grandmother always teach us how to care for the earth. I mean, I obviously am bringing it back to the book, but she talks about plants being like people and just having that education of this is the land that you live on. You need to respect the land and honor it and revere it. And how is that taught to just people, you know, like how, how do we teach that to people to understand? And, and if you think of these industrialized systems, they're not building industry thinking about how it's going to help the earth, right? They're thinking of industry, how it's going to help the humans and how it's going to help us not thinking about the ramifications of what's going to happen a hundred years from now, how is this particular piece of equipment going to impact the ecosystem? You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, we can, we can go off on a tangent on that, but um, I think everything that you're saying, I, I totally agree. And I think it's part of our superpower being empathetic beings, being able to, observe and do what we can in the short amount of time we're here on the planet to make this place better, right? Mm -hmm. So that being said, let's open. Oh my, I'm still getting birthday texts right now. They're just like popping up. I feel bad. I keep saying it's not my birthday today, but if you want to text me again on Tuesday, you can. You can. It's your birthday month. I know. I love when people do this, when they, you know, I have uh, Sahara will do this, right? She'll like celebrate her birthday for a month and I love it. You know, I love every minute. I love when people want to celebrate and I think it's great and it's so much fun, but I've just never been that person. You know, I'm always wanting to just, I love celebrating my birthday day. It's always special. I always try to make it feel magical. And then, and then I'm excited for the next one, you know? Yeah. You don't feel like you need a whole month. I don't necessarily do. (laughs) No, thank you. I'm okay. okay, You know? Fair enough. Yeah. All right. So here we go. Chapter nine, uh, page 129. You are radically engaged. And this is apropos to our conversation. I feel Uh, Radical truth, inquire within, engage with others. Raquel's birthday is on July 17th. Oh, that's the same birthday as my mother-in-law, by the way. July 17th and Glenda Pendergrass's birthday is July 17th. So Mm -hmm. cancer's ruling the roost. Mm -hmm. Every relationship has its ups and downs. If we ignore our relationships and think they will simply continue as they always have, then we're not paying attention. If we think things will eventually change for the better, but we don't have a plan for change, then we're not actively pursuing what we want. Being in a relationship is among the highest forms of spiritual practice. For many of us, though, when we are in a relationship and in love, we think about all the ways our relationship could be better. So more on that. Tessa's going to talk about that bit. Uh, In contrast, when we aren't in a relationship, romantic or otherwise, we think about what it would be like to be in one. The mind always wants what seems better. When when you're first dating someone, you experience the excitement, joy, and ecstasy of being with with someone new. The butterflies in your stomach, the giddiness of getting a message from them, the excitement of being in the person's presence. Those feelings eventually fade away. The cloud of newness dissipates, and that's when you get to to know the person. That's when you're, well, what I wanted to say is that when that's when shit gets real, right? But my editor thought that was a little too colloquial. Hmm. Um, uh, you're no longer intoxicated by the hormones coursing through your body during the attraction phase. The beginning of a relationship is really you just experiencing yourself. 
You can sense the love, but really the experience of love is happening within you. And now this is a key important thing for us as humans to understand so that we begin, the whole idea behind that statement is to really understand discernment and its value to our lives. You can make a conscious choice to actually engage, did I skip something? Oh no, it takes a lot more than initial attraction to see who the other person is. You can then make a conscious choice to act actively engage with that person or not. So I think that even just that bit for the purpose of the conversation today is really the discussion around what that experience means for us, how we can navigate it, and what are the ways that we can engage with ourselves so that we don't get intoxicated by the feelings that we're feeling and create a relationship that's not healthy, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, and also to understand the fact that relationships go in phases as well, that it's not always exciting. And there are moments where you can utilize a relationship as a spiritual practice when things aren't going well. Oftentimes, because we have a plethora of choice, we think when something's not going well, we use it as an opportunity to look elsewhere and see, oh, this is not the right person for me. I need to go looking for something else. And we often fall into that trap. And sometimes we make mistakes. And sometimes we even ruin relationships when, for some of us, the teaching is in that conflict. It's learning how to be in a space of neutrality and learning what you need to learn in a state of observation and a state of stillness because two people aren't growing at the same time. And it's important for us to see and understand if I'm growing and my partner isn't, that doesn't mean I need to go find a partner that's growing like I am. It might feel like you do. And for some cases that might be true, but we, we won't know that unless we learn to discern, right? So people oftentimes are just skipping from one relationship to the next because they're not giving themselves the opportunity to actually move through that storm. Instead, they want to move away from it and choose the easier route, which is I'm going to leave this person because they're not seeing who I am, this new new way of being. So I'm going to go and be with somebody else when perhaps the magic lies in being able to move through the challenges with your partner and growing together so that you create a stronger bond. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah. It makes so much sense. It's so, it's interesting, Rosie, Rosie and I, from the perspective of having both been in long-term monogamous relationships for over a decade and you're coming up on two decades, I believe with Tori, right? Mm -hmm. And going through those phases and actually really living this conversation <laughs> um, and, you know, thinking about the idea of um, that very real thing that happens, like, oh, the grass is greener over there. Oh, what if my partner did this work with me? What if my partner had the same, uh, you know, hobbies or um like things that we we did together mm -hmm. and then there's it always it almost always seems like and I've had so many conversations with you Rosie and with other friends about like um w is it important that your partner has the same not hobbies isn't the right word like do you have to have one central passion that you share together in order even if you're growing at different rates do you have to have that one, at least one thing that you do together that keeps you together as a foundation of the relationship so that when you go through your ups and downs, when you go through those phases of growing or stagnation, there's this central thread that brings you back together um, as your foundation. And I don't know if I have the answer to that. I haven't really figured that out for myself, but I certainly can, can, um, identify with this chapter very yeah. much. <laughs> and, uh, and I always, I think the thing that comes up for me lately is because I've been watching the crown and I just watched this, the last 
episode where spoiler alert if you haven't watched the crown put your earmuffs put your, on put your earmuffs <laughs> earmuffs i've seen it all so i'm i'm good but we know the history like we this is common knowledge the the love affair of prince uh, charles and princess diana and that whole kind of tragic thing and because he was in love with somebody else he was in love with camilla and um he never loved princess diana and it was it's like so here's a question that i was wonder about this idea of a fairy tale or love at first sight or that one true love or you could call it soulmate right Mm -hmm. how do you know that that is a thing that actually exists versus something that is just a fairy tale that doesn't exist and why do we always seek that ideal of you could call it the grass is greener but you know wanting to be in the fairy tale of love forever and ever and ever, even though, is it real? Is it not real? It seems like when I watch the show, I get wrapped up in that idea of, well, Prince Charles just really loved Camilla. I mean, look, he he loved her before he married Princess Diana. He loved her the whole time he was married to Princess Diana. And then he divorced Princess Diana and married Camilla and they're still mm-hmm. married. Mm-hmm. So there's an example of real life where yeah. it seems to be true. The ideal you're saying. Yes. The ideal of, I mean, look, I, I really do believe that if you believe that there is an ideal for you, then that, then that is what it's going to be true for you because you believe it. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think that's where the crux is, is for a lot of us, if we don't have the bandwidth or the capacity to understand that we are responsible for making that ideal, that it's not just going to show up at our doorstep. Uh, You know, Amazon Prime isn't going to just deliver the perfect ideal relationship for you. It's going to take a lot of work and sometimes it's going to take some sacrifice on both ends. I think if we understand that that ideal exists, but it's probably not going to be what you visualize in your mind. Yeah. Right. That the experience is going to be different. This is a conversation I have with Tori all the time. And I don't know if we've talked about this on the podcast or not. Perhaps it's been even conversations that I've had with him when he's been on the podcast, but I, I can use myself as an example. Every time I've been Uh, excited about something, the visual in my mind is always going to be, and I write about it, right? It's always going to be better in my mind than it is in real life. The minute that I have that experience, there's, I've, in my experience, it's been really lackluster. And perhaps it's because I'm very imaginative and I really can visualize and feel something. I'm going to use like going to Disneyland for example. I've been waiting all year to go to Disneyland and I'm so excited and I've been waiting for my birthday to go to Disneyland. It's going to be so much fun. And I really have to cherish it because Tori will only go if it's my birthday because he hates going to Disneyland. He thinks it's just waiting crowds and it's hot and it's, we're walking all, it's just, it's, it's not for him, but he's willing to make that sacrifice for him because it's my birthday. Right. So I'm looking forward to this and I'm building it up and I'm just really excited. And the minute that I get there, I realize I also don't like to be in large crowds and I also don't like to wait in lines and I won't eat half of the stuff that they're selling there. So then I get really hangry and then we're waiting in line and then it's hot and I'm applying sunblock every 40 minutes. And then it, it, it once I'm there, I realize this is not actually as fun as it was in my mind when I was fantasizing about coming to Disneyland. I'm just using that as an example, right? So then there's this element of disappointment. Now we take it into career aspects. We take it into other relationships of that idealized version. So for me, I I now know that I... I'm really good at visualizing and experiencing things in my brain. Now, I can say to myself, I'm satisfied with even just the thought. And that makes me happy because I can experience the feeling now, like if it's happening this moment, I love going to Disneyland. It makes me happy. I can get in that 
ecstatic joy right now and not have to drive all the way to Orange County to go experience it. You know, Mm -hmm. for some people, that's enough. I've trained myself to feel the feeling of having it now really is, is, is more, uh, is stronger than me driving two hours to Orange County, waiting in line, doing that whole thing. And, and sometimes that's not going to be enough. Right. So, so it's just understanding yourself and knowing yourself at a deeper level to understand if I'm constantly being disappointed, what's the common denominator here? Mm, Yeah. Right. Is it me constantly blaming other people? And it's because of other people that's causing me to be disappointed or is it my expectation? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that for me in, in the context of what you were saying, the idealized version of a relationship, it, it totally goes hand in hand. Don't you think? Yeah, for sure. I, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing, Rosie, you called it uh, from the very beginning. It's the, the key here is the ability to discern. And I think that's my ultimate question. Um, it's so easy to get swept up in the idea of ra- romance, the, the ideal of fairy tale, the soulmate, you know, this, this story we're fed from, from childhood. At least I was, cause I loved my princess books. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Right? I mean, look, we, Tori and I are in the middle of planning our wedding. Finally, you just mentioned, yeah, we've been, we're getting married on our 20 year anniversary, which is very exciting. And we've never planned a wedding before. And I've wanted a wedding since I was a child, right? I mean, the big dress, the, not big dress, I don't want a big princess dress, but the dress, the mariachi, the every, the food, just the whole, I want a pinata, like the whole experience, right? I've wanted this forever. And, you know, Tori and I have not the last 15 years, not necessarily been in the best financial position to have a wedding. Neither of us come from rich families. So the wedding would come from our pockets. We have to pay for everything. And both of us just every year I've decided eh, it's not really an expense that we want We want to do. We're finally in a place now. Tori's turning 50. I'll be 40 next year. And we are pretty settled. We've got a nice house. We're a little bit more in a position where we feel like, all right, if we don't do it, we're just never going to do it. So I start to try to bring to life these visions. And, and as I talk to Tori, Tori's just like, what, like, what are you wanting to do? What is this experience? And he's like, is, do you really think that you're going to have this magical experience? And I'm convinced that I will, right? I'm like, this is going to be amazing. But the thing that you're making amazing, it's going to be for other people, right? Like the people that come to the wedding, the people that gather, and it's a gathering of, uh, you know, it's going to be a small wedding because it's a small venue and and we just don't want to make a, a big, big, thing. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really excited talking about the princessy thing. I started watching say yes to the dress, by the way, have you ever seen that show? I don't think I have. My God, is it it older? Should I watch it? It's like, (laughs) it it started, I think back in 2013 or 2012. I I can't say I'm going backwards. I started the newest and then I'm going backwards, but I mean, some of the stories are so, by the way, I'm worth deviating a little bit, but that's okay. I think. Thanks Raquel. She said, mazel. Um, I started because I have no idea dress. I, this is all stuff that as much as I've planned having a wedding my entire life, it's not necessarily something that I know how to, I've never done it. I have friends that have done it. So I'm kind of doing a little bit of recon. Obviously, Tessa, I've asked you your experience, which is a topic for maybe Wisdom Wednesday, which I think we should have. Yes. Um, But it's so one of my friends was telling me, uh, asking if I have a dress yet. And I'm like, I have no idea. No, 
I don't have a dress yet. I I wouldn't even know where to begin. So I, I found this show called Say Yes to the Dress and I just got addicted. It's so cute. The stories to me are what get me. You know, the mm-hmm. stories of, I mean, there was this w- woman who she was an Afghan vet, had been at the Pentagon when the Pentagon got hit during 9-11 beautiful story. She was getting married and Kleinfeld's is this famous bridal salon in New York City. That's where they base the show in and people travel from all over to get their dresses there. And their budgets range from, you know, $2,000 to like $20,000, right? I mean, people go really extravagant. And the story was so beautiful. Basically, they gifted her the entire experience she had a, an, an endless budget to get everything she needed. And it was just, you know, Tori and I were just like both like sobbing. We, cause it was just such a beautiful, such a beautiful story. There was another story of this woman who had lost her wedding dress during a storm in New Orleans. Her, her family, her house got flooded. They didn't have flood insurance and they showed up and they, whatever. So this is how you get addicted to reality TV, by the way. <laughs> So I started watching. Oh my God. Okay, wait. I watched the show when I was planning my wedding. (laughs) So I think this is a thing that women go through when they're planning a wedding. They start watching Say Yes to the Dress. So I started watching it. And to me, it's interesting how so many of these women are coming in and they have a vision and it's the princess and they want this, this fairy tale. And I think it's great. You know, I think it's wonderful that people have that desire. Women specifically, I feel like it is conditioning from childhood and the stories that we read, Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, you know, all of these Disney princesses that have these fairy tale weddings. And I think that to me, I I get a little bit apprehensive because I guess I've always been more concerned with my relationship being good than us having a wedding, right? Because if I could have, I would have married Tori right the first month after we were together. And then that would have, had we gotten engaged, we wouldn't have been able to really know each other. We would have been distracted by the planning of the wedding. And then once you get married now, oh, let's have a family. You would have been distracted with the kids. Now you have kids. Now you have multiple children. You're distracted by the children five, six, seven years later. When it's time to really get to know each other, people then, this is why we have a high rate of divorce. Because sometimes if you don't give yourself enough time to get to know your significant other, all you're experiencing is yourself. That's what I say, going back to the beginning of this chapter, you're only experiencing the feelings that you have yourself. So I'm always curious as I work with people or as I observe, as I experience this myself with other things that it can be applied to career, it could be applied to friendships, how we create this ideal, how we live this fantasy in a sense that can serve as fuel for us to progress and move forward and create, co-create with the universe. But at the same time, potentially it could hold us back from having an experience or growing or seeing what else is possible because we're so stuck on this idealized version of what we think our life should be, Mm. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's such a helpful reminder. I mean, I think it's one thing to say that it's another thing to, to know it and embody it and live your life from that place. And, um, I mean, I certainly go through phases where I'm like, yeah, that's, I can see that. I feel like I have enough life experience to really feel it and be present with that in my body. And other times that it's, it's like watching the crown and I get lost in the story. And then I'm like, wait, now, Where's this foundation of reality that I was just an hour ago feeling firmly planted in? Yeah. (laughs) It's so easy to get Do you think that, I think also this foundation of reality can sometimes feel a little negative for people, don't you think? Because, yeah. I think that's why it's so important to have things like 
stories and, um, and to be able to see like, oh, that is something that is possible. I can see how they got to that place. Um, and it gives you hope. Like we need that sense of hope. What were you going to say? I cut you off. No, that was, that was it. I, you answered, you went in my brain and answered oh. the question. <laughs> that's what you okay. do. Okay. I think that's, um, I, I think that's, that's it on on that topic unless everybody anybody has any questions i think the biggest pros i would like to uh leave you all with question wise is what does that look like in your life are there moments in your life where you've created this ideal in your mind how have you been able to navigate getting what you wanted or not getting what you wanted? And how do you continue to apply discernment into what you're doing and how you're co-creating with the universe? How are you able to create more balance in your life, a more authentic, grounded existence? Um, that chapter specifically, I think, is... Um, probably one of the most powerful uh, ideas to consider in the entire book because it's the one that is most glossed over. Oh, engaging with myself. What does being engaged really mean? I'm more concerned with engaging with others and how other people think of me than what I think about myself. Or I'm more happy when I'm serving others and put myself at the end. And it doesn't matter that my arm is broken and my leg's not working and I'm like dragging myself around energetically as long as I'm helping others. I mean, that's not really serving you, right? I mean, that is not you engaging with yourself. And so I'm sure a couple of people, if not everybody uh, that's here now or listening to this or watching this later uh, can relate to that. So that oh man look at the time time flies when you're having fun what is this so Wild. we we want to thank you all for joining this radically loved session this third installment of our book club stay tuned for the next one and it'll be the last one on you are radically loved we're going to do the final chapter which is you are radically loved and I think it's going to be really fun because I want to share a couple of stories that didn't make it into that chapter that I don't know what to do with. Uh, and and it's funny seeing the chapter and seeing the book as it is now. It's it's complete the way it is, and I almost feel like would it have been better had I incorporated these other elements or you know, you don't know what you don't know. So I think it, it's just going to be fun for me to share that part of the process as well. So we'll do that next week. Uh, there's still time for you to join our session. So just go to either uh, my Instagram and get the uh, free registration for the book club there or a link somewhere else. <laughs> my newsletter, that's probably the best place. Sign up for my newsletter. Uh, or you can just go to my Instagram and just click the uh, link in my bio. And there's tons of links there for things that you might like and need. Um, I think that's it. Tessa, do you have anything you want to share? Oh, I just, because you started to talk about engaging, um, there's this one sentence that keeps jumping off the page at me that I'd love to close with. Um, in terms of establishing that engagement with yourself um, and knowing when you've kind of fallen off that track. So the difference between engagement and connection is this. Engaging with someone is an intentional practice. If we say someone is engaged in writing, we mean that they are making a conscious effort toward the practice of writing. If someone were to say that they were connected to writing, we might assume that is simply a mental attitude about writing. Um, so I think this is exactly what you're speaking to, Rosie, in terms of um, engagement being conscious and intentional. Um, and I think that those are really uh, tangible 
bellwethers, I guess, if that I could use that word there, <laughs> to to remind yourself, okay, am I engaged or is this something I'm kind of doing unconsciously? And that's from page 131, if you just turn the page from where we started today. Love, love that. Thank you. And thank you all so much for being here, for spending some time with us today. And we look forward to seeing you again. I'm going to tell you the date so that you don't have to go searching for it. That's going to be August 5th at 12 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we will be here live. You can bring your book, your tea, your coffee with your questions. And I hope you guys have an amazing rest of your month. Enjoy. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you. And happy birthday to all the summer birthday mo- so birthday uh, uh, individuals celebrating birthdays this summer. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved Podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.